Welcome to today's webinar, An Introduction to Real-Time PCR. My name is Lita Steffen, and I'm an application scientist at ProMega. In today's talk, we'll start with an overview of real-time PCR, some of the basics of real-time PCR, as well as a look at the data. In the second half of the talk, we'll talk more about the chemistries and instrumentation involved in real-time PCR, and we'll spend some time discussing dye-based chemistries like Cyber Green and label-based chemistries like TACMAN. We'll also touch briefly on using qPCR or real-time PCR to monitor RNA templates, so that would be in reverse transcription qPCR, and we'll look briefly at the instrumentation. In the third part, we'll touch on quantification. Um, I don't want to delve too deeply into it here. I think there are a lot of very good resources online, but we will talk about the math involved so that you have a better understanding when you look at those resources. And we'll end with the Mikey guidelines, which are probably the most important point of this talk. So as a refresher, PCR starts with a number of reagents, and what you're interested in doing is copying the DNA to a level that you can use it in downstream applications or for analysis. The reagents that you're going to include in your tube are a thermostable DNA polymerase, often TAC polymerase, DNTPs, a divalent cationic cofactor like magnesium chloride, buffer, and then the primers or oligos for your target of interest and the template or sample. And I'm going back over this because the kinetics and the reagents involved in traditional PCR are very similar to those involved in real-time PCR. Once you've assembled your PCR reaction, you place it in a standard thermocycler and you undergo a number of cycles of dissociation, primer annealing, and extension by the TAC polymerase. And this is just an example of a protocol. There are many varieties of a protocol based on your reaction conditions, your primers, and your template of interest. When thermocycling is complete in traditional PCR, you are not done with your DNA analysis. You need to find a way to visualize your target. And we typically use gel electrophoresis for this, where we will electrophoresis our target, or amplified target, in an agros gel. So I want to go over some of the kinetics of a PCR reaction because, again, those are going to be identical to what you see in a real-time reaction. So let's just say, for simplicity's sake, that we start with one double-stranded DNA copy. In that first cycle, then, we will denature those two strands, allow for annealing of our primer and extension by TAC polymerase. And at the end of the first cycle, we have gone from one copy to two copies. In cycle two, we'll do the same thing. Denature, anneal extend, and now we have four copies. In cycle three, denature, anneal extend, we have eight copies, and so on. And you can see that each cycle, if I'm copying every target strand, then I will have a reaction that looks like um, your starting concentration times 2, times 2, times 2, times 2, which we express then as an exponential. So this is going to be my starting concentration times 2 to the nth power, where n indicates the number of cycles. If we graph this information, um, you will see a nice exponential curve. So here I'm graphing copy number versus cycle. An exponential curve would start you know, close to baseline and then would increase exponentially and keep increasing. PCR doesn't do that because after a certain number of cycles you start getting depletion of your reagents, you might have inhibition of the TAC polymerase. And so at some point in this particular um, graph, you're seeing it here where it's kind of linear around say 27 cycles on up, you're going to see inhibition and lower efficiency of amplification and eventually you'll reach plateau phase where there's no additional accumulation of product. So what most people use for traditional PCR is actually an endpoint PCR reaction. In endpoint PCR, you'll cycle all of your reactions essentially to completion. So here I'm showing the amplification kinetics of five different reactions, um, all serial dilutions, reaching plateau. 
In endpoint PCR, we would then capture those DNA targets at plateau and analyze them with gel electrophoresis. As you can imagine, since we're at plateau, we are not quantitative. But we do get information from gel electrophoresis about the size and number of products that we amplified. There is a way to make traditional PCR somewhat quantitative, and we call this a semi-quantitative PCR. Um, and instead of analyzing your reactants at completion or at plateau, now we're analyzing them at some intermediate cycle number. And you'll usually use uh, like a radio label also to increase sensitivity of detection. So semi-quantitative PCR has a very limited dynamic range, and I can demonstrate this in this figure. So this is the same data, but now let's say I stop my reactions at cycle 20. I will be able to detect some of those reactions within their um, amplification curve. Others, however, may have too low, of exp or too low of amplification, too low of copy number at that stage to detect. If I were to stop all of my reactions at 30 cycles, some of my reactions have already reached plateau. So that's not very useful quantitative information. But there is a little bit of a sweet spot here in the middle, or say around 25 cycles, where all of my reactions have been amplified to a point that I could possibly detect them, and most of them have not reached plateau. However, as I told you before, most of this range in here, where you're seeing a straight line essentially, um, are not the best point for measuring quantity because you're already seeing depletion of reactants and inhibition of that PCR reaction. So uh, you do not then get linear quantitation with respect to input amount. So there is certainly a limit to semi-quantitative PCR and a narrow dynamic range. And this is where real-time PCR really shows huge promise. Instead of capturing your product and analyzing your product at a single cycle, we will now measure the amount of product at every cycle, which gives us a lot more information and a lot more quantitative capability. We do this using a fluorescent DNA marker, and I'll talk more about those chemistries uh, in the second half of the talk. So we're going to measure the fluorescence at every cycle now for every sample. And I've changed the y-axis here to reflect that. So now instead of copy number, we're measuring fluorescence, or RFU, relative fluorescence units, which will be proportional to the copy number. This obviously will require a specialized thermocycling instrument that's not capable just of thermocycling, but is also capable of fluorescent detection at every cycle. Because we're assaying um, our samples during the PCR reaction, requ we require now no additional sample handling. So there's no gel electrophoresis that you need to perform after this um, type of a technology, which also makes it high throughput capable. Because we're capturing information at every cycle, we have a much broader dynamic range, now 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 8th fold difference in concentration. It can be quantitative, and it can be very, very sensitive. If you use multiple fluorescent DNA markers, you can imagine this is now multiplex capable. And the last point I want to make is that for most robust quantification, it's usually recommended that you keep your amplicons small. So whereas an endpoint PCR, you might be looking at a multiple, like a 2KB amplicon, in real-time PCR, we tend to keep amplicon sizes below 250 base pairs or 200 base pairs. And it will vary based on your target, whether or not you get efficient quantification and efficient amplification. And the last thing I want to point out on this slide is that real-time PCR goes by a number of names. You should not confuse real-time PCR with RT-PCR, which is reverse transcription PCR. But we do often use real-time PCR interchangeably with quantitative PCR or qPCR. And you'll hear me use those terms interchangeably during this talk as well. So now I want to take a moment to have you actually think about the data. And this will kind of help you develop a gut sense for how to look at your data. So in this first question, I want, to, I want you to take a look at this data. Again, I've plotted fluorescence versus cycle for each of five targets. You can see each one here is a single amplification trace. 
which sample has a higher target concentration? And you should be able to explain to your neighbor why. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Okay, so when you're looking at this data, the amplifications that are detectable first or have the earliest detectable fluorescence are going to be the amplifications that started with the most product. It takes them fewer cycles to amplify to a detectable quantity. So the leftmost traced is going to be the sample that had the highest initial concentration of your target. And this leads to the, one of the main points of um, real-time PCR data interpretation is that amplification is going to be inversely proportional to your starting concentration. If I have higher starting concentration, I'm going to get earlier amplification. So let's look at back at that data again. Here's that mock data starting with one target. And we see exponential amplification during the early cycles, which is actually really hard to see here because of the scale. And then in the later cycles, we have some inhibition. But we can look at that easily on this kind of a scale, on this linear scale, and then plateau. Unfortunately, when we are looking at data in the linear plot, it's really difficult to detect changes in the early cycles, which is when amplification tends to be most efficient, closest to an exponential. So instead, a good way to look at the data is it using a semi-log plot. So now we're using a logarithmic plot on the y-axis, and we still have that um, linear plot for cycle number on the x-axis. By using a semi-log plot, now we're looking at fold change in copy number as opposed to actual copy number changes. And this allows us to get a much better idea of the exponential phase of amplification. So here you can see um, that there's a nice constant linear slope through quite a few of those early cycles. Then around here we start having a slightly lower slope and eventually even lower and then plateau. Now this data is mock data, as I mentioned. We actually can't detect fluorescence of one copy or 10 copies or 100 copies of target. So the initial cycles will have um, fluorescence that bounces around quite a lot. And you can really only detect maybe right in um, starting a little bit before cycle 10 or cycle 15, depending on the concentration of your starting DNA. If I compare those two plots side by side, again, this is the exact same data with the linear plot on top and the logarithmic, semi-logarithmic plot on the bottom. You can see how little um, information you get about the exponential phase from the linear plot versus the logarithmic plot. Quantification is most robust in the exponential phase of amplification because you have no depletion of reactants. You have no subtle differences in um, tack inhibition due to accumulating products. So you're going to get the most consistency from well to well and therefore the best quantification. So we strongly recommend that every time you look at your data, you look both at the linear plot and at the semi-log plot as a quality control measure for quantification. So now how do we get from raw data to quantification? What does the software do? Every software platform is a little bit different, and the algorithms are proprietary. So I can only really discuss in more general terms. Some platforms first perform a normalization to a passive reference die. And here I'm thinking about platforms like the ABI platforms. For these systems, you need to include a second fluorescence die in your PCR reaction that is a different emission wavelength. This passive reference die should not be influenced by DNA concentration so that you have a constant fluorescence level across your amplification cycles. And the software will then normalize or divide your reporter fluorescence die to, by your passive reference die at every cycle. And this is supposed to help normalize against things like detection and emission differences from well to well and cycle to cycle. The next step is to subtract the background fluorescence. And in some cases, you'll see that the y-axis for those graph stays is RFU. Other systems, it might change to things like delta R, dr, or drn. 
But remember how I told you those initial cycles are below the detection limit of your instrument. So the, the software will look at um, the number of cycles that are within that background. It will average the background fluorescence for each reaction, and then it will subtract that average background fluorescence at each cycle for each well. And this will have the effect then of both changing the scale, so you can see before my RFUs are in the thousands, and now by subtracting the background I'm scaling to zero to start. It will also bring in outlier wells, whether these are outliers due to detection or maybe something's um, not quite right with your uh, cycler. But you can see here I have one very high fluorescence outlier that when I perform background subtraction, this then is pulled into the mix of all of my other replicates. It's hard to see here, but performing the background subtraction also has um, the benefit that it tightens up a lot of your technical replicates. After background subtraction, the software, software will fit a curve to the data, and this helps so that you can identify cycle numbers that might be fractional, so you aren't just working with whole cycle numbers and twofold differences. And it will determine a value or apply a number to each sample, so you can use this quantitatively. And we call this value the CQ, or the quantification cycle. And you may see in the literature or on different platforms that they call it different things like a CT or a CP, but the field is moving towards standardizing the vocabulary and it's requested that you use CQ in all of your publications concerning real-time data. So there are two main methods for determining a quantification cycle. The first is the threshold method. For the threshold method, the software will draw a horizontal line at some threshold that is higher than the background and is within the exponential phase of amplification. The CQ value then that's determined for each amplification reaction is going to be the value where that curve fit crosses that threshold line. So this would be the CQ for the earliest amplifying samples, which if you remember are the samples that had the highest starting DNA concentration. The threshold can be variable between assays, so if you're amplifying multiple targets on one plate, or if you are using different chemistries on one plate, you need to actually exclude the other chemistries or the other assays when looking at one assay, or you may not have your threshold drawn in an optimal location. Remember I told you also that you need to make sure you do the your quality control, your data check, by looking at the semi-logarithmic plot. So now I'm showing you the semi-logarithmic plot of that exact same data with the same threshold drawn. You can see that the amplification efficiency or the exponential amplification of all of these samples is parallel at this point. So we are in the optimum region then to draw our threshold. This is also a good place for you to look when you're doing quality control to make sure that what you're quantifying is PCR reactions that amplified with the same efficiency. Um, if you saw a trace, for instance, that had this kind of a slope, you would know that you had some sort of inhibition in that PCR, and then there, that quantification may not be accurate. The second group of methods goes by a number of names, has much more variety, I think, in how the algorithms are written. Um, but you might see it referred to as like a regression method or a second derivative maximum method. These methods tend to look at each well as a separate entity, um, regardless of what else is on the plate. Instead of looking at a set threshold across all wells, what it's looking at is might be something like um, the point of maximum fluorescence increase. So where does this particular reaction come above, statistically above its background? Or where is the um, greatest inflection in the curve fit, which would be where is the, the highest amplification efficiency? The, the CQs that are determined this way are going to be independent of other wells or assays on the plate, so it doesn't really require you to do the same kind of um, separation of, of assays when you're analyzing them. 
And my personal um, experience has that has been that I get more consistent data from plate to plate. You still don't want to directly compare CQs from plate to plate and expect them to be quantitatively identical, but it does give you a good way to gut check if you are getting amplification like you expect. So now we'll move on to talking about real-time PCR chemistries and very briefly about the instrumentation. There are, again, two main kinds of chemistries that we use, a dye-based chemistry or a probe or label-based chemistry. So the dye-based PCR technologies will be technologies that you might hear of at like cyber green, bright green, LC green, or EVA green. These use a double-stranded DNA binding dye that has very fl low fluorescence when it's unbound. As the primers are allowed to anneal and extend, you get stoichiometric binding of the dye to the double-stranded DNA and a huge increase in dye fluorescence. The double-stranded DNA binding dye will measure all double-stranded DNA in the reaction, so you need to optimize your reaction if you're quantifying with these methods to make sure that what you're quantifying is just your target of interest and that you do not have nonspecific products. This technology can be um, really easily adapted to any existing PCR assays. And I have an asterisk here because your PCR assay, no matter what it is, if you are moving to real-time PCR from a traditional PCR, if you've pulled an assay from um, the literature, if you've gotten it from the colleague down the hall, or if you buy a quote-unquote pre-validated assay, they all still need to be validated in your hands. And I'll talk more about that later. Because all we're adding to our PCR reaction is this binding dye, these technologies, the, the dye-based qPCR technologies, are significantly less expensive than other qPCR technologies. But also, because they're binding to all double-stranded DNA, they are not easily multiplexed. However, they do allow for melt analysis, which can be used for quality control and genotyping. So a typical qPCR reaction might look something like this. And I'm showing you this, a screenshot of the BioRad CFX software. All the softwares are going to be a little bit different, and all of your protocols will be different based on what template and what primers you are using. But the one thing that will be common is that you will tell the software to measure fluorescence at the end of every cycle. For a melt analysis with a dye-based technology, that melt analysis will be performed after amplification. You will ask the software or the thermocycler to drop the temperature of your reaction and then to slowly increase that temperature, taking images or fluorescence measurements the whole time. So as you increase temperature, you'll, your double-stranded DNA amplicon will start to denature. Um, as it denatures, the double-stranded DNA binding dye will be displaced and your fluorescent signal will be decreased. So then the melt peak, or the maximum change in the fluorescence, will be the TM of your product. And as you can imagine, this will be impacted by the number of amplicons you have, the size, and the base composition. The data looks like this. If you're looking at the raw data, you're going to have fluorescence versus temperature. And you can see here that right in the middle of this maximal decrease in fluorescence is probably going to be the average TM of my product. It's easier, however, to look at it in melt peak format, and most software will show it to you in this format. So here I have the change in RFU versus change in temp plotted versus the temperature. And again, you can see that my TM for this product is just a little under 80 degrees Celsius. So how do we use this for quality control? If you are amplifying the same product, you will expect the same TM of that product every time. If it's a single product, you expect to have a single melt peak. So you can look at your melt analysis to see if you have a single product of the expected peak. There may be circumstances where you don't have your anticipated target and your primers have interaction, so you get primer dimer. Um, peaks, which would be a very broad, low TM peak. Here I actually expected a TM of around 85 with these primers. And then in circumstances also where you're looking at RNA gene expression, you want to make sure that you are quantifying your cDNA target, 
and not any carryover genomic DNA that you may have from your purification procedure. There are a lot of genes out there that people use for normalization or as reference genes that amplify both the RNA target or the cDNA and the genomic DNA, like GAP-DH, um, as well as beta-actin, which has a really small intron. So I, I actually have a, a set of beta-actin primers that I use to qualify all of my RNA samples and make sure I don't have genomic DNA contamination. And I can see that in my reactions because genomic DNA, in this case, has a, a small intron, which increases the size of the target and increases the melting temp of the product. So I can use the melt then as quality control. You can also use it if you are wanting to detect multiple products. So these two PCR reactions um, and melt analyses come from reactions where I was expecting to amplify two products. Here the two products have melting temps very close to each other. Here those two products have melting temps that are a little farther away from each other. And in specialized circumstances and with um, sensitive software, you can also use this for very specific genotyping, which is called high-resolution MELT, or HRM analysis. So moving on to the probe-based technologies. Unlike the dye-based technologies, these probe-based technologies are much more heterogeneous, and they use a number of different methods to have the fluorescence of detection mimic the accumulation of copies. They use typically your standard unlabeled primers, but in addition there are extra primers that are sequence specific and are labeled with a dye. Having this additional sequence specificity is going to increase the specificity, specificity of your target detection. But you do need to be aware that if your probe um, also is sequence specific to the genomic DNA target, if there are pseudogenes, or even possibly homologs or orthologs, you may not have perfect specificity even with a probe-based technology. Because you require specific probes that are dye labeled for your assay, this becomes a more expensive technology. However, it can allow for detection of multiple targets in one tube, and we'll talk about that. They may also require a lot more optimization, though, if you're looking at multiple targets in one tube. And the leading technology, which is the TACMAN assay, doesn't allow for a melt analysis, so you lose some of that quality control opportunity. This is a non-exhaustive list here at the bottom of some of these probe-based technologies. Like I said, TACMAN is the most commercially available option for probe-based qPCR, but there are a lot of other very good technologies out there. And I'll refer you to this paper by Navarro if you want to get some more information on the alternative technologies. Alternative technologies may turn out to be a better fit for your particular application. So let's talk a little bit more about the TACMAN assay. The TACMAN assays are actually called a fluorogenic 5' nuclease assay. That means you're generating fluorescence using the 5' nuclease activity of TAC polymerase. So in addition to your unlabeled primers, which I'm only showing one here, you will also have a dye labeled probe, and I'm using R for reporter, Q for quench. When that probe is intact, the, the energy of um, the reporter will be transferred to the quench by resonance transfer, so this would be a fret activity. As TAC polymerase starts to extend that primer, however, um, if the primer is bound with any specificity to your template, TAC polymerase will encounter that probe and will start to degrade that probe. As the nuclease activity of TAC degrades the probe, you'll get release of the reporter. So it's no longer in close, close proximity to the quench, and now that reporter can fluoresce. So again, as you have amplification, you're relying on the 5' nuclease activity of TAC polymerase to degrade your probe releasing your reporter and allowing it to fluoresce. These technologies are not reversible. Um, you will not be able to recombine your reporter with your quench, and so you can't use this for a melt analysis. But what you can use it for is multiplex analysis. So imagine now I have two different targets, target one and target two, and I label the probes for these two targets with different fluorophores. If I was using a dye-based technology, 
I would have to devote separate wells to each target. So at maximum, I could get 48 wells for each target. However, if I now multiplex them with a probe-based technology, I can amplify both of these targets in a single well. That means I get twice as much information out of the same amount of sample. It also means I have better normalization because I'm assaying the two genes in exactly the same well. But in order to do that with any robustness, um, it does require additional assay design, optimization, and validation. And you will be limited by the um, instrumentation that you have available, specifically what filters are available to match up with your uh, emission dyes. I'm not going to go over this table, um, but I wanted to include this table so that you have a reference to look at the differences between dye-based qPCR and probe-based qPCR. What I do want to end on is reminding you that either technology requires you to validate it in your hands. It doesn't matter if you've identified the reaction conditions and the primers from the literature, from a colleague down the hall, or if you've purchased them. You still need to make sure that they are operating in your hands with your sample types with the efficiency that you expect. So let's talk briefly about reverse transcription qPCR or RT-qPCR. You may use this technology when you are looking for gene expression, biomarker discovery, RNA sequencing, uh, an analysis of RNA viruses, or cDNA cloning. And this technology will combine um, a, a reverse transcription step where you are making a DNA copy of your RNA template and the PCR. We're using TAC polymerase then to copy that cDNA. TAC polymerase is not capable really of um, using RNA as a template, so we use reverse transcriptase, which is an RNA-directed DNA polymerase. So it uses an RNA template to make a DNA copy. Much like TAC polymerase, it requires priming uh, and a cationic cofactor. And there are some downsides to RTs. The wild types have an RNase H activity that you need to moderate, um, and they also inhibit TAC polymerase and amplification, so you need to look at your efficiencies of amplification. So there are two main types of reverse transcription reactions. You will see two-step RTQPCR and one-step RTQPCR. As the names would suggest, these refer to the number of steps required. So in a two-step RTQPCR, you're doing the reverse transcription and the PCR in separate tubes in separate reactions. In the one-step RTQPCR, you put both the reverse transcriptase and TAC polymerase and you perform both reactions in a single tube. So in the two-step reaction, what you're typically doing is making a pool of cDNA. So you're making cDNA to represent many varieties of the RNA that are present. In addition to the reverse transcriptase and an RNase inhibitor, which is usually recommended, you also need to include primers. And there are two main types that people use. We either use an oligo-DT primer, which will bind to the poly-A tail of messenger RNA, or we use random hexamer primers. You might use an oligo-DT primer if you want to get a full-length transcript to clone. You might also use it if what you're looking for is, say, a low-expression mRNA, because you might be able to enrich then for the mRNA pool in that overwhelming background of total RNA and ribosomal RNA. You might use a random hexamer, um, however, if you have potentially degraded RNA where you may not have that poly A tail, or maybe if you're looking for an RNA species that is not an mRNA. In the second step, after you've made this pool of cDNA, you take a small portion of it and you use it in PCR as normal with your gene-specific primers. And this can be performed either as PCR or qPCR. A one-step reaction, as I said, combines both enzymatic steps into a single tube. So you set it up as for qPCR, but you add your reverse transcriptase and RNASIN. Instead of making a pool of cDNAs, you will now transcribe only your particular location of interest. So you only have one set of primers in here, and those are your gene-specific primers.
the cycling is slightly different. You will have the reverse transcription step first, and that's usually performed somewhere around 37 to 45 degrees Celsius for something like 5 to 15 minutes, and your protocol may vary depending on your template and your kit. There's then activation of your hot start TAC, which performs double duty then and inactivates the RT, and then you have standard qPCR cycling. The benefit over two-step reaction is that it uses far less sample, um, so it's part particularly useful for things like quant and QC of FFPE RNA, where you have very little target. But it also gives you um, an idea of standard deviation of your replicates over both enzymatic steps. So this is something that you can't do with two-step unless you're actually performing um, replicate uh, reverse transcription pools. There are many real-time instruments on the market now, so this list is certainly non-exhaustive. It's just the ones I'm most familiar with. There are a lot of hardware differences between them, but what most users are probably going to focus on is what filters are available, so what probes can I use this with, and what kind of specialized hardware is there. <clears throat> is there the opportunity for uh, a gradient block so that I can optimize my qPCR easily? Um, do I need 96 well plates or 384 well plates? Do I allow for fast cycling conditions? Software, there are even more differences, um, especially with the algorithms and the analysis methods that are offered, as well as how much flexibility the user has. And there are a lot of ease of use considerations as well. How user friendly is the software? How easy is it to manipulate the data to make it most easy for you to present? Can you use it on your desktop computer? Do you have to do all the analysis at the instrument? And in addition, there are some specialized features. Like, do you want to genotype by HRM? Do you need to barcode your samples? Do you need traceability for IVD use? And so now a very brief introduction to quantification. I just want to give you the foundation to understand some of the basis of quantitation when you start talking to your colleagues or when you start reading through some of the resources that I'm going to show you at the end. So let's look at some of that same data. So sample A is shown in blue, sample B is shown as in red. And remember, sample B has to have a higher starting concentration because we are seeing amplification earlier. If I look at the copy number, let's just say sample A is 1, sample B is 10, um, copy number is scales with that starting concentration. So this leads to my first expression. The quantity at a given cycle is going to be expressed as the starting quantity times 2 to the n, where n is the cycle number that you're looking at. But I'm usually not looking at two samples at the same cycle. What I'm interested in is looking at two samples at the same fluorescence or the same copy number. So if I use a threshold method as an example, sample A will reach that threshold value t at some starting quantity times 2 to the x, where x is the cycle that it hits that threshold at. Sample B will hit that same threshold with proportional to its starting concentration times 2 to the y, where y is its cycle number. Because the threshold is the same for both sample A and B, we can set those two expressions equivalent. A times 2 to the x equals B times 2 to the y. And with a little algebraic manipulation, this comes out as the ratio of expression of B over A equals 2 to the x divided by 2 to the y. And here you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. A is related to x and B is related to y. So why do I have this flip-flop of numerator and denominator between the two sides of my equation? But that relates to the inverse relationship. So remember, if I have higher concentration, I'm going to have a lower CQ for that. 2 to the x is the same as 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 x times. 2 to the y is the same thing, y times. So this whole expression will um, cancel down to 2 to the x minus y, or 2 to the delta CQ. And you'll hear this called the delta CQ method. So write this one down. B over A 
equals 2 to the delta CQ. Now I'm going to make a point here of saying this is not recommended because there are a couple of assumptions involved in, in this particular example. Um, but that this mathematical idea is the relationship that you'll see used in almost all uh, quantification analysis. So the first assumption is that amplification efficiency is perfect. And it almost never is in an individual's hands. So let's look at what kind of an effect that can have. If I have a delta CQ of these, between these two samples of 5 and perfect amplification efficiency, I want you to take a moment now to figure out what the expression difference is between sample A and sample B. And I'll give you a few seconds for that. So hopefully you've gotten as far as understanding where to plug the numbers in in that equation that we talked about. The expression ratio between sample B and sample A is going to be 2 to the delta CQ, which here in this case is 5. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 32 fold different. So we would say these two samples start with 32 fold different concentrations. Now, however, let's say amplification efficiency is only 80%. So now instead of having two targets after every cycle for one starting target, now we're going to have on average 1.8 targets for every starting target. If I plug this information into my equation for the same delta CQ, I have B over A equals now 1.8 instead of 2 raised to the delta CQ, which is an 18.9 fold difference. So this is really different than that 32-fold difference that we saw if we assumed perfect amplification efficiency. And that then reflects on our first assumption. So instead of using 2 to the delta CQ, you should be measuring the assay efficiency experimentally with your reaction conditions, your primers, and your samples and instrumentation. And use that amplification um, efficiency in your calculations. Assumption number two with the delta CQ method is that identical amounts of starting material were used from each sample. So this would mean if you're looking at RNA expression from one milligram of a particular tissue, that you had identical um, amounts of starting tissue, identical purification yields, identical storage, and identical pipetting into your final PCR reaction. And that just doesn't happen. So instead, we normalize to a reference gene that is expressed at a constant concentration. And we say that that reference gene then is an indicator of how much of the starting sample we used. This would be called then the delta delta CQ method where you normalize expression between your gene of interest and your reference gene for your sample and then you normalize between your two samples. And this leads to assumption three, that your reference gene expression is constant. You'll see a lot of people have picked up GAP-DH, beta-actin, Tata binding protein, other, other um, primers that they just happen to have in their lab that are considered housekeeping genes, and they use those as their reference genes. But if they do not validate that those reference genes are actually expressed at a constant amount in your system and under your treatment conditions, you could be getting entirely false data. So I hear a lot of people tell me that it's way too expensive to run the controls and make sure your reference gene is, is constant. But I did this experiment in one of my um, graduate labs, and I found if I used their reference gene, I saw that my gene of interest was like upregulated tenfold, for example. If I used the reference gene of choice for the lab down the hall, my gene of interest was supposedly downregulated tenfold. So you, the reference gene that you choose and the appropriateness of that reference gene can really impact the validity of your results. You might as well spend the money to actually look at validating your assay rather than waste all that time and all that money and publish incorrect results. And I would refer you then to Hillemans and Van de Sampele for an excellent overview of this kind of problem. Which brings me to my last point, the Mikey guidelines. This should be a document that everybody who performs real-time PCR is familiar with. Mikey guidelines are the minimum information for publication of quantitative real-time PCR experiments by my hero, Mr. Buston. Um, 
and there were uh, there was a group of individuals um, who were f very familiar with using this technology and the math around quantification who got together to show that it's very important that we report our information more thoroughly about how these experiments are performed and that we use a, a common vocabulary and look really at all of the variables that can affect our quantification. I would suggest that before you perform any qPCR assays, you look at this document because it will make it much easier for you to perform a valid assay, appropriate quantification, and to publish your data. Otherwise, you may find when you come to publication, um, a lot of journals are now requiring that you turn in this information, and you may find that you have gaps in your experiment and are unable to publish with that data. So in particular, this describes minimum reporting requirements for how your sample was manipulated, including nucleic acid storage and extraction. It requires description of assay reagents, protocols, and controls. So it gets you thinking about what controls are necessary, how many reference genes should I be using. And it also talks about assay validation, which I would remind you is required even for purchased assays. Because things like um, carryover of purification chemicals may be affecting your amplification efficiencies. For assay validation, it's recommended that you look at the sensitivity, specificity, and efficiency of your assay with your targets of interest in your kind of samples, and that you also validate your reference gene stability. And finally, there is a description of the calculations and how you should report those for quantification. And I'll now leave you with a number of resources. We have two existing webinars on qPCR that have a little more information, and you will receive links to those in the follow-up to this webinar. Also, as I said, start with the Mikey guidelines. Um, you can find that both through PubMed and at the um, Gene Quantification website for free. The Gene Quantification website is an excellent resource for all things related to real-time PCR. And if you're looking for real-time chemistry um, description, you can find that in Navarro et al. And then, as I said, Hellemans and Van de Sampele really seem to lead the field in how to look at reference gene stability and how to quantify your RNA targets. So I would refer you both to their paper, and I think they have um, an online webinar, and there's also some free software and some software available for purchase that can help you determine and validate your reference genes. And finally, our customer and tech serve here at Promega are very, very good at real-time PCR assays and understanding some nuances and controls with assay validation. So we would refer you then to our tech serve customers if you have specific questions on your assay. And with that, I'll take any questions.